Hi everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you how I did the border collie on the right hand side. Now this was done in pastels and as you can see it was of two border collies. The one on the left is already available as a time lapse tutorial with voiceover on YouTube so I will link that in the description below if that's of interest. Now there are a couple of things that I want to mention about this and it's going to focus predominantly on a couple of areas. One of them is going to be how to draw short white fur. Now I've got many tutorials here on YouTube showing you how to draw different types of fur, the different elements to tackle and how to layer that. Now with short fur it's it's quite different. I want to make sure that I'm paying attention to how short my pencil strokes are. That's really important. If we do lengthen those pencil strokes we are then going to be adjusting the overall fur texture which in the long run is not ideal because we will be making this look like a long haired collie rather than the short haired. Now when my client first inquired about a portrait they were initially swayed more towards graphite. Now that being a black and white medium it would have worked perfectly well for the fur there would have been no problems there but here I felt it would have been a real shame not to incorporate that lovely blue eye colour. So I really wanted to make sure that in fly here that was captured and I did therefore recommend that I think pastels would be best. So there are going to be instances where one re reference photograph, one dog, would work with multiple mediums. But in something like this, obviously this one blue eye is very unique to her. So it would be really important in the portrait to capture that. So that's why, as I've mentioned, that we swayed towards a colour-based portrait. Now, as you can see, I start off with the eye first and then I do focus on the fur around the eye. I like to break everything up into small manageable sections. I find that I'm far more efficient with how I work. Now this will be the case regardless of anything that I'm tackling. I do find that I am far more motivated to keep working on that one portrait. Now this is a prime example. I've got the eye in and the fur. I'm starting to build in those mid-tone highlights and then I'm going to start working on the ear itself. It's already now resembling fly in that reference photo. So if you're finding that you're spending more time hesitating looking at that reference photo, it's probably because you're looking at too much of a larger area. Really do break it down into one or two square inches at a time. Now a common question that I'm asked is, because I draw in my backgrounds first all of the time, how do I not smudge my pastels? And that's going to be especially important when you're working on a darker fur subject like I am here. My background has got lovely light cream colours, some of those beiges. It would be very easy to get some of those darker pigments on my background. Now the reason why I am not smudging my work here is I do have that sheet of glassine under my hand as you can see. That is really important to make sure that your hand is never in contact with your artwork. This is going to be the one biggest factor that's going to prevent you from smudging that artwork by your hand. Now you'll also see at times I'll lift up my glassine and you may see a small blue round circular applicator in view. That's just like an air puffer tool. You can squeeze that, some air will come out and it will help to keep that surface free from any light pastel dust. That's going to help to stop you from then pushing that pastel into that background when you do then re-rest your hand on your artwork. Now one big tip. The glassine with pastels has a real tendency to pick up some of that pastel on the opposite side. So what I like to do in between stages is take that glassine off of that easel because it is taped in the corner. I will then run it with a microfiber cloth on one side, the side that's in contact with that artwork. And you'll find then that there's a, usually a very light thin film of pastel on the opposite side. I do like to clean that intermittently so that then I know I'm not transferring coloured pastel across to my lighter areas and so on. Because you will notice it with the darks as well. There can be cases where it looks like your blacks have almost faded. Now most of the time that's really not going to be the case. Light fast colours, you know, a colour takes a while to fade in general conditions. I do like using my light fast colours so therefore my colours will not fade. But what can happen is you can end up with a very light covering of the lighter pastel dust that settles over your darker areas, which then in turn can make them more of a grey colour. So always wiping off the underside of the glassine can really help. So onto the white fur here. Now I do have quite a few tutorials on Patreon showing you many different fur textures. My Patreon channel focuses on more of the pet portrait side. I do have wildlife work there and tutorials to follow along to, but I really would like to offer the different dogs, cats and horses, so that my Patreon members can then implement those tips and techniques into their own pet portraits and potentially look to do that as a full-time or part-time um, job, if that is their interest. 
So the white fur there is covered in real-time tutorials and if my slower in-depth tutorials are of interest I will link my Patreon in the description below. But as you can see here where I'm building up this white fur I started off with a lighter base layer, I'm adding in my shadows and then I'm adding my details. Now the way that I draw white fur is quite unique depending on the reference photo. If I've got white fur that's particularly bright I will go in with a lighter base layer and I will work from light to dark. If I've got a white dog that's potentially looking a bit more on the greyer end of the colour, so more of those tonal values, I will work from dark to light. Now there is always going to be an exception to the rule. There are no one set guideline for each portrait. As I say, I do interpret it depending on what I can see in that photo. And that's why I do have a few different tutorials showing you that in the different situations where I work from light to dark and then dark to light, just depending on that photograph. But as you can see, it's really important. I'm not forcing detail. With this dog here, I still want this fur to look short, but I also need it to look more soft. I don't want it to have the wiry appearance of a dog like a Border Terrier, for instance. So I have to make sure that although I'm drawing in my individual white hairs, that I'm not making them too harsh. If I force too much detail here, the fur texture is going to look far more wiry, and I really don't want that. So it's about finding a balance between the right tonal values and then how much of that detail you can see. Now if you see a reference photo and it's a good quality but some of the fur you can't see any real definition within the individual fur strokes, that's telling you then that that fur looks a little bit softer. If you have a good quality photograph and there is one area where you can't see detail, there is usually a reason for that. So it's okay in that instance where less is more. Because as I say, if you force detail, you will then be adjusting what the overall fur texture looks like. Now, if you're working from a low quality photograph, that is, of course, going to be different. And that is one of the, again, one of the common questions that I'm asked. How do I know what detail to add in if I've got a poor photograph to work from in the first place? So because of that, on Patreon, I do have a dedicated real-time tutorial from start to finish working on a poor quality photograph. It's actually of my very first family dog. And I, I think that's about six hours long that. And I've, as I say, it's all in depth, step by step from the very beginning first base layer to those final details. Now, the reason why I decided to do that as a real time tutorial is because when I work from a lower quality photograph, there are decisions that I make in the in that moment. I think, right, the fur here, I cannot see it at all in that reference photo. So therefore, I need to do this. So that's why I wanted to make that as a real time tutorial. So that voiceover is added while I'm drawing. I can explain every thought process that I make. Now, as you can see here, the fur on the bridge of the nose and around the nose itself, there is not any of that individual fur detail like on the top of the head. I want to make sure there that that is deliberate. The fur on the bridge of the nose and around the muzzle is significantly shorter than anywhere else on the face. If I make my pencil strokes there as long as the other areas on the face, I'm going to make it look like the fur on the muzzle is fluffier. And again, I don't want that. It's all about capturing the right fur texture. Also look at how many subtle greys I've added in there. I've not gone down with one solid white and that is crucial. The biggest tip when drawing white fur is white fur is never truly white. Usually the brightest part of a portrait is going to be the reflection in the eye. Now again, there's not going to be no set rule, no set guidelines, and this was the case here. There wasn't an overly bright highlight in either eye. The fur was the brightest part. So I had to make sure then that I didn't get any muddying up of my layers. So here's a prime example. I started off with my light colours and I'm building my darker values on top. The reason being, and, and this is going to be a little bit more down to the artist and how they like to work, but the main reason for me is I want to make sure here that I don't go too dark. I want the fur to look white, but white, as I say, it's never truly white. I've got lots of greys, sorts of mute, muted, um, sort of warmer brown colours in there. I want to build up those values gradually, but I also want to make sure that I can still get my details nice and bright. So if I work a bit more cautiously and put my lighter layers down first and build up the darker values on top, I know then that I'd never run the risk of going too dark and not being able to get it back up looking like those lighter white values. 
Now, one last thing that I'll mention about that, if you've got a a reference photograph and the dog is laying on grass, for instance, they might have a strong green reflection in that white fur. Again, just what I've mentioned, white fur being very reflective, it potentially will have those additional colours. If you've got a portrait and the owner has asked you to leave the grass out or it's a head and shoulder portrait like what I'm doing here, I do make that decision to take the green tint out of the white fur, out of the reflections on the nose because again that's a wetter surface, it's going to have more of the colour there. The reason being if you're not including the grass in your portrait, someone looking at your artwork will think well why have they drawn that dog with a green reflection, it won't look right. Whereas if they look at a reference photo and they can see the grass, their brain will automatically think, right, well, that's why there is a green reflection in the white fur. So for me, that is a choice that I do make on the pet portraits. As I say, if I am asked to leave the grass in, then of course, add that green within that fur, any colour. You'll have some of the blues potentially within the reflections of the eyes. Those I always leave in. I think it adds far more shape and form to the eye. But strong green reflections from grass, I do like to leave those out. So one other area when you're working with a dark marking that's up against white fur that can be very frustrating is you can end up with muddying up of the colours. Now this is something that I cover a lot in my Patreon tutorials and I do have a black and white cat tutorial on Patreon where I can really explain how to avoid that happening. So if that's of interest, as I've mentioned, my Patreon is in the description below. Now the main way that you're going to be able to avoid that muddying of layers is just to make sure that the pencil lead is always kept clean. But there is a specific technique that I like to use, a layering process there to avoid any muddying up of the colours at all. You can see here just how crisp my tiny whiter details over that dark brown marking look. There is no faded appearance there which can happen with that muddying up of the layers. One last thing I'll mention as well, white fur, just because we think it's one colour, which it really isn't, as I've said, we have a tendency then to not allow the same amount of time on that white fur as other parts of the portrait. That's really not the case. I actually spend far more time on white fur than anything else. The main reason is there are so many tonal values. There are different variations there within the fur it is so important that I want to get that depth there as accurate to that reference photo as I can. Now I do think white fur is one of the most challenging colours to get right because of all those different elements that we have to think about so if you've got any questions about drawing white fur anything art related then pop them in the comments below I am more than happy to help. So I hope this quick time lapse tutorial with some hints, tips and techniques here were of use. If it was, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you want to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube very soon. And yeah, as I've mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you want to see the collie on the left, I will put that in the description below. And as always, thank you so much for watching.